Welcome back to the Machine Learning Street Talk YouTube channel with me, your host, the ex-Microsoft tech lead, Dr. Tim Scarf, Lightspeed Yannick Kilcher, and Henry AI Labs, Connor Shorten. We have three incredibly talented researchers from FAIR in Paris, Marianne Lachaud, Baptiste Rosier, and Guillaume Lampert. And it's incredible having the original researchers to come on and talk to us about what their thought process was. Having the authors of a paper on the podcast is always a very special treat because you kind of get to probe not only the paper itself, but the, the thinking process behind it and kind of the experiences made, like look into a real project of research. And that's pretty cool. So here's an example where it's pretty straightforward idea and it seemed to work pretty well. And all that's required is a little bit of thinking outside the box. So I think this can be taken as a lesson for the rest of us. There are probably all these things that no one else thinks to connect to each other, like programming languages and natural language models. I'm sure people have done it, but it seems like with a little bit of creativity, you can do a lot of cool things in this world. I had a blast doing this and I hope you enjoy as much as I did this uh, conversation with these very skilled people. Uh, have fun. Now, the really innovative thing they've done is created an unsupervised language model for programming languages. In neural machine translation, there are typically lots of examples of language pairs translating from one thing to another thing. That doesn't really exist in programming languages, so the encoder part needed to be completely unsupervised, looking at individual corpora of programming languages. Now, the way that they've done this is programming languages have a significant intersection. Even if you compare, say, Python with something like C Sharp, you'd be surprised that many of the tokens intersect each other, especially if you break down the tokens using word piece embeddings, which is the modus operandi in the language processing world at the moment. So it's actually a reasonably simple idea but they've got incredible traction with it and it just works very very well. I have just a big database of documents and these documents I, I know they're all they're all in English okay and I have this other big database and I know that they are all in German. I just know their documents are in German, but they don't correspond to each other. They're just German documents. And over here, they're just English documents. They don't, I don't say that these two here are somehow the same. No, I just have a bunch of German, a bunch of English. They don't even have to correspond. They're just text. And now what I want to do is I want to learn a shared embedding space. I sort of want to learn a shared space of embeddings for these two languages such that similar things are mapped to the similar place so if these two documents just happen to talk about the same thing i want them to be mapped to similar spaces in this shared embedding space so i'm going to have one model a single model where i input the text and it goes into this shared embedding space okay now, this is unusual because usually in machine translation, if you translate from here from English to German, then you'll have your dedicated model that takes as English as an input and German as an output. So first of all, how do we make the same model? Let's say, so let's say we have the perfect encoder, right? This is E, the encoder, the same encoder for all languages. Let's say we have the perfect encoder and it can map the if, if whenever a sentence means the same thing in different languages, we can completely map it to the same point in embedding space, irrespective of the language it comes from. One of the things we spoke about in the show is the potential for something like this to revolutionize software engineering. Maybe in the future you can use your own programming language of choice and your IDE or even GitHub would store an intermediate representation. So currently we have a real specialization of languages and lots of people use different languages for different reasons. But something like this might bridge the gap in a strange way. You could even take it a step further. Rather than looking at individual files, you can start to look at entire projects. You could model the topology of a project, perhaps using a graph spectral representation or something like that. Software is still something that requires human beings. There's a lot of intelligence there, but there are so many things that software engineers do which are repetitive, time-consuming tasks. And all of these things, either at IDE time or at compilation time or at storage time, could cut the friction out of the process for us to do software engineering. So it's really, really exciting. I'm not sure if that's Facebook's intention, but it could be one of the consequences of this fascinating research. So the paper we're looking at today can take the code on the left, which is written in Python, 
and can output the code on the right, which is written in C++. Now the point here is that the code on the right does the same thing as the code on the left. So it is implementing the same function. The surprising thing here is that the, this model that takes the Python as an input has never been explicitly trained to output C++. So this is an unsupervised translation model. And that's the, the cool thing about this paper is that by having no supervised signal at translating source code languages into one another, it can perform pretty well at the task nonetheless. They say a transcompiler, also known as a source-to-source -source translator, is a system that converts source code from a high-level programming language such as C++ or Python to another. They say transcompilers are primarily used for interoperability and to port code bases written in an obsolete or deprecated language such as COBOL or Python 2 to a modern one. Gwalium you would probably recognize because he's put a lot of work out recently representing mathematical equations as well, first of all, he decomposes them into a taxonomy and then he represents them using language and then of course he can put them into a transformers language model and he's got incredible traction with that. Uh, Yannick did a couple of videos on his papers and even though there are high level rules for representing mathematical equations, things like integration are a little bit more of a black art and the incredible thing is that these language models, even though arguably they're doing pattern recognition, they're doing memorization to a certain extent, they are still very, very cleverly and um, being able to um, give you the answer to, to these mathematical representations. And I think uh, Gwalium is doing some interesting work at the moment, taking that an, a step further and being able to automatically generate mathematical proofs. We talked about some really interesting things in the show about the, the work that they had done modeling this thing using transformers. It, it seems at the moment that you can model almost anything with transformers. And it shouldn't be a surprise because if you can verbalize something in language, then why not put it into a transformers model? So that was really interesting. Um, they talked about their thought process so when when they built the encoder how did they test it how did they verify it was working we had a bit of a philosophical discussion about uh, testing and robustness and, and how they think about that i hope this is the start of many many more similar episodes to come we are really interested in talking with the primary authors on the state of the art deep learning research projects so please reach out to us if you are an author or if you uh, know someone who you think that we should be talking to please reach out to us so how does the encoder map the different languages to the same space such that the same things are ending up in the same place? It seems, it seems a bit counterintuitive, right? Because it doesn't know which things correspond to which things. Now, the first thing you need is a shared vocabulary here. Since we are in a shared space uh, right here, the, what you need is a shared vocabulary. So you tokenize all of the text with a shared vocabulary. And this vocabulary is going to consist of sort of word pieces. Now, if you don't know what word pieces are, in a word piece uh, tokenization, what you would, you, what you would do is you would split words into so-called word pieces. So, for example, hello right here might be split into two word pieces. The first word piece might be hey, and the second word piece might be llo. Okay. There is usually like some kind of indicator here that this is the end of a word and so on, but we'll simplify. And hollow right here would be a H A for the first token and then L L O for the second token. And these kind of word piece encodings, since the smallest units are going to be the characters themselves, they ensure that you always have everything is in vocabulary. You have no out of vocabulary tokens. But here you can already see that if we tokenize the languages like this and then we use the same encoder so the same encoder will pop them into this shared space that means that to the model this and this looks like the same thing it is the same thing right it's the same input token in different languages how do we tell the decoder which is also the same model like how does it know what to do this is a little trick where you basically, you take this embedding, so you take the input, you put it into your model, I don't even know how you go this, and then your output is going to be autoregressive, right? So you decode one token at a time. So you decode 
this token and then you feed it back into the model and then you decode this token, you feed that back into the model and so on. This is an autoregressive language model. And the trick here is that the first, the very first token is a special token that describes the language you want to output. So here you say, I want German. And then you let the model decode its, its thing. And by conditioning on this token right here, it knows it should now produce German. Uh, you will simply, during training, you will simply put the token here. And if it produces something other than German, that's a, a loss, right? So it will learn to produce German after you produce this tag. Remember to like, comment and subscribe. Hit that notification bell. We love reading your comments. But I've always, I've mispronounced this like a hundred times. People told me in the comments, it's Guillaume, not Guillaume. <laughs> yeah, people, people in the comments on these papers, they were like, aren't neural networks just universal function approximators? Why is this surprising? And <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Cool. Well, welcome back to the Machine Learning Street Talk YouTube channel and podcast. We have an incredible team from FAIR, from Facebook Research, and you folks have just published a really amazing paper doing, it's kind of similar to machine translation, unsupervised, but for programming languages. So which one of you would like to give us the elevator pitch? Imagine someone's been in a cave and hasn't heard about the work that you've done. Can, can one of you give me the elevator pitch? We basically trained an unsupervised translator, which is able to translate between programming languages. And in this paper, we tested it in, on Java, Python, and C++. So the previous methods that uh, were used to do that were mostly rule-based. And basically, people will uh, just encode a lot of translation rules to, to be able to perform these translations. And of course, that's very time consuming and it requires a lot of expertise in both the source and the target language. Also, these uh, kind of programs are not very generalizable. Like if you imagine that you already coded something which is able to translate from C++ to Java, and then you want to translate to Python instead, uh, well, you basically need to start over from scratch. So there are also some machine learning methods that were developed to translate between programming languages, but they were often limited due to the very limited num amount of data available for programming languages. Um, there, there are some examples of projects that were translated from a language to another, and so it gives some amount of data, but it's not the case for every language pair. And generally, the number of examples of functions and uh, with the correct translation are only in the tens of thousands. And um, so they were not able to do that for any language pair and the performance were quite limited even when they were able to do it. So that's why we decided to develop a completely unsupervised method for that. And um, so we are able to train on a lot more data and it's very easy to generalize to more language pairs because you just need to Code to, some, to have some code to tokenize um, the input code and to detokenize on the output. And it turns out that it's better than rule-based methods for Java, Python, and C++. The, the interesting bit here is this really that is it is unsupervised. And I've seen a lot of papers in unsupervised translation, and they kind of try to align the latent representation and so on. But your paper does something, relies on sort of a different fact namely that there are some things in these languages that are actually the same words like minimum like min or apps like all kind of functions like if statements are the same how how important exactly is that or could could you get around this like how many of those overlaps do you really need to make this work because really all this model has to go on is these tokens that are the same uh, I think you really, as you said, so one thing that is very important in the unsupervised machine translation is to actually learn some really good cross-lingual uh, representations. So your modern has to learn to align this representation and it is uh, useful to and needed to, to have some common uh, token in different languages. So with code, uh, we have the chance that uh, you have so all the for, while and common token keywords that you that you mentioned but you also have all the um, 
the variable names that are common because always in English, so between the languages you, you find the same. And you also have uh, English token in the comments. So here we have a lot of common token that we call anchor points. And they are really, uh, really useful and helpful uh, to have this cross-lingual representation. And they are needed. I think without that, you, you just can't uh, align these representations. There is a kind of phylogenetic tree of languages. Just like in the animal kingdom, that there's a kind of hierarchy of, of things inheriting and, and, and composing. So what would it mean to do that in, in this cross-lingual model? Would you ever be able to learn a greater sphere of languages? Is it, is it something like, can you, ever, can you ever extract like something higher level? Or is it always between like individual languages, right? Can we ever build something where we understand all of the all of the programming languages at the same time. You're looking at leaf nodes on this phylogenetic tree. So you're looking at, let's say, Python and C++ or something. It kind of depends then on the diversity of the languages that you choose and how much of an overlap they have. Have you folks mm. thought about another method where you could perhaps learn uh, the evolution of the languages and, and learn it in a more holistic sense? Yeah, so there was one reason why, uh, so typically what happens with natural languages is that, so I think it's from this paper of Thomas Mikulov in 2013, where they show that if you train word to vec on English and you train word to vec on French, basically what you have is that you have one set of embeddings in English and you have the same one in French. And the thing is that this set of embeddings are basically like almost isometric. I mean, like there, is, there exists a very simple transformation uh, that can map the English embeddings to the uh, to the French embeddings. It's just a rotation is, is simple enough. And the thing is that, I mean, the interesting property here was that uh, whatever language you consider, whether it's English, French, Chinese, or any language, you can basically find some, some basically some mapping between these languages. And the closer they are, the, basically, the more this mapping can be orthogonal. Uh, but in this particular case of programming languages, uh, what was a bit different was that unlike in natural language, uh, there are things that you can say in one language that you cannot express in another. For instance, pretty much everything you can say in English, you can say it in French except a few idioms, but apart from this, pretty much everything can be translated and this holds for, this property holds for any language. But in Python, and let's say Python C++ or Cobol, there are things that you can write in one language that cannot easily be translated to the other. So this is why there is not like a perfectly, this mapping doesn't exist, or if it exists, it's definitely not trivial at all. This is why we were not really sure that this was going, uh, going to work. So the approach that we used here was a bit different. Typically, for natural languages, what we did was that we actually started from this word embedding. So like we train some word embeddings in the two languages, we find the alignments, and then we start from this. So here, this will not, probably this will not have worked, this approach. Uh, typically, if you train word to vec on some uh, C++ tokens and some Python tokens, I really doubt that we will have observed this same mapping uh, between these two languages. I mean, typically, everything that corresponds to NumPy in Python, there will have been nothing corresponding like to the other, in the other languages. So there is, this mapping will not have existed and it's unclear uh, how it will, have, it will have worked. This is why we actually employed a slightly different approach here, which was uh, to build on top of XLM, where here the pre-training is done by actually learning just a big language model uh, on the concatenation of all of these languages. And this is where the alignment happens, basically, like with Marianne said, with the keywords that are in common, but also with the commands, the, the English commands that people write in the code, which is the same in pretty much any language. Yeah. Could you maybe take us through the, just kind of through how you come up with a research idea like this? Because, because it's, I mean, it's, it's so improbable that one day you just be under the shower and you're like, hey, I could, you know, apply these three wildly different things, you know, programming languages and unsupervised translations and same tokenizers. How, what angle did you come from? How did you develop the idea itself? I think a lot of people are, you know, struggling to actually come up with even ideas of what to research. Yeah, so we were thinking that all the advance we were seeing, sorry, that all the advance in the unsupervised machine translation work very well for all natural uh, languages, for all natural languages that don't, where you don't have access to any actual, actually parallel data. So we were thinking that as for programming languages, you don't have any parallel data, but you have 
access to a lot of uh, monolingual data. And this unsupervised machine translation uh, models work very well for natural languages when you have a lot of uh, monolingual data. We're thinking that as you can tokenize code the same way that actually you tokenize some uh, with different tokenizer, but you can tokenize code and make sequences the same way as you do for uh, natural languages. We said that uh, it could be a, a good fit actually for programming languages to, yeah, to try these, uh, these methods. And so we, we wanted to try. And we thought I, uh, actually that because you have these anchor points that uh, Guillaume and, and I uh, told, told you about, uh, this, this was a reason why, plus the fact that you have a lot of monolingual data, it was two reasons why uh, it could work. So we wanted to try. And did you, so what, what was in, in making it work? What was like the biggest, the biggest point where it didn't work? Because it, in these papers, you know, it always seems like, and then you write the beautiful blog post and everything just happens to be so like, like the, the outcome is extremely pretty, right? These, you can translate between these functions and so on, but like from experience at some point in the middle, you're just like, this, this is never going to work, right? I, this is unsurmountable. What was sort of the, the stepping stones and where did you run into problems? How did you fix them? Okay, actually, uh, I think you are going to be a bit disappointed, but everything worked and we're, we were very lucky. No, but that's true. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so the timeline was like, we first uh, wanted to, to try to train the, the language model just to see if the model can, can learn these cross-lingual representations, because if, if it cannot, then you can't do anything. So this was really our first step. So the first thing we did was to, after processing, pre-processing and tokenizing the, the, um, the code, we learned this language model. And the first thing that we, we do was just to test it. So to see if the cross-lingual representation are, are learned. So we, we, we first check the token embeddings and to see when looking at uh, one token, for instance, one keyword like, uh, I don't know, int, if what are the nearest neighbors and to see if the nearest neighbors are uh, integer or an equivalent in another language. And actually it, it was the case. So for, for us, it was like a, a real good step because we saw that uh, cross-lingual representation are learned. And uh, the second thing with this uh, language model is we try to uh, generate some code just to see if the language model uh, learned to generate some syntactically accurate code. So we try to, on a notebook, just, just, just this, to, to, to give like uh, the beginning of a, a function and to see if the model was able to generate the, the end of the function. And actually it did. <laughs> so we were like, okay, so the model is able to uh, learn cross lingual representation, is able to generate some syntactically correct uh, code. So we were amazed. <laughs> and we was like, okay, this is a really good step to, to keep going. And then we, we learn so the, the step to, to translate. And again, we, we just uh, test our model on, on a notebook and we gave like a little function in Python to see if it can translate uh, into another language. And again, it was, it was working. <laughs> and so after we just had, it was not a problem, but the, the, the main like effort that we uh, had to do is to, to have an actual uh, metric to evaluate our model, not just to, to test on the notebook and to have a parallel test set because we didn't have any. So we had to, 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 to create one. So as we explained in the paper, we, we extracted one from, from the site uh, gig for gigs and we, 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 run, we built some unit tests to test the gener generated function. And we, we try to find a baseline because when you have some score, if you don't have any, any baseline, we, we, can't, we can't say that, yes, it worked, no, if it's, it's kind of hard to, 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 to see. So we took the, the, the commercial one, two baseline that are rules-based baseline, and we were better than the one commercial rules-based baseline. So we were like, that's amazing. And then, yeah, we wrote the paper. So we didn't, yeah, everything worked well. So <laughs> I'm quite interested in your process. You, you said, for example, it's, it's analogous to word to vec in some in some ways. And what you might do interactively on a word to vec model is 
run Tisney or something and look at the projected position of the words and you would see that words that are semantically similar would be very close to each other. And I don't know, would you would you just do that interactively or would you come up with rules so that you know that your the architecture and the way you're training the model is going in the right direction? How, how are you reasoning about the, the, the behavior of the encoder? Yeah, we just tested the token embeddings. We didn't test the, the old sentence embedding because it was much uh, harder to test, actually, yeah. So, so I, because I, you gave the example before of you would take int and something else and you would look at the cosine distance or something. Did you just come yeah. up with a load of those rules and use that as a test bed or, or was it, how did you quantify it? We just look at the, but Betis, maybe you can say more because you did this part, but we just look at the nearest neighbor in all our dictionary and just to see if this nearest neighbor has a, has a meaning or is just like random. We didn't really quantify it. We just tested on a, on a few examples. And since it was uh, working on all of them, or almost all of them, we considered that it was uh, OK and that we didn't need to go. We didn't need to go any further. That, that's yeah. fascinating. I, I, I'm, I suppose the reason I was asking the question before is clearly for example, English is a Germanic language, and if you look at the evolutionary tree, we inherit a lot from Latin, but we, we don't have any intersection with Arabic languages. So it stands to reason that if you take a couple of languages in Europe, there'd be a significant intersection, and it would work very well using your method, but sometimes it wouldn't work. And I just wondered whether you had a formalism of reasoning about at what point does it stop working and what factors influence it. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly what kind of uh, performance we will get if we were to use this model to translate from uh, COBOL to C++, for instance, because, I mean, even the for loops are different, even the way to do um, additions and multiplication don't always use the, the mathematical operators like in uh, Java, C++, and Python. So there will definitely be a lot less anchor points and maybe it wouldn't work as well uh, with this version and we would need to find some some more tricks to make it. Learn more to back on this, so you have some embeddings for all your English words. But what we did was basically trying to artificially modify the overlap between the languages by putting some uppercase, like for in one language, so that you, can, you cannot have this match and simply that, and that was still kind of working. So yeah, and even some experiments where we align English to English, but um, by training the word embeddings individually, and it was, I mean, the alignment was always perfect. You want them to share a common ancestor, but how far away that ancestor is seems to be relevant. And I just wonder, is this an example of where you might impute some kind of prior into your language model so you understand what the evolutionary tree is? And if two languages do share a common ancestor, but that the distance between them is quite far, could you augment them by finding two intermediate languages and training on those as well? Yeah, so what we try to do, so for instance, there are some languages like uh, English and uh, Nepali. So if you train unsupervised machine translation systems between these two languages, it doesn't work really well. So one issue with that is that there is absolutely no overlap between English and Nepali. Like the, it's not the same alphabet. So what is working though is that if you train, um, if you pre-train your model with English, Nepali, but also Hindi, so Hindi is using the same alphabet uh, as Nepali. And also in the Indie corpora, if you have a lot of English English words, which in practice happen, I mean, if you have an Indie corpus, there will be a lot of English words here and there. So if you train a natural language, I mean, if you train a language model, all of these three languages, basically you will improve the performance uh, bit, basically between Indie, uh, sorry, between English and Nepali. So having like some languages in the middle, which is connected to the two, can actually improve the performance between these two very far languages. So it's actually what we did for English to Nepali translation, and we can actually go from a performance from like two plus score to like 15 or something like this. So it's actually, it makes a very big difference, yeah. One of the, one of the things with languages is, that, right, they cannot share the tokens and so on, and then they can become hard like COBOL and C++ and so on. But there are other things that, that I kind of came to my mind where you actually do share the tokens, but that might not fall under the traditional view of a programming language. So things like, like pseudocode, they share a lot of tokens, right? They share, but the pseudocode, everyone writes pseudocode a bit different. And then like something like UML diagrams, like there are lots and lots, all these, all the people in companies, they write their UML diagrams, their class diagrams and their methods and their dependencies and so on. And there should be a significant overlap between that 
and variable names and class names and so on. Can you ever think of maybe something like this would work where you can specify like a UML diagram and then generate the the code for it with the implementations of the functions or something like this? Or would this be completely out of scope? Yeah, so first for, for pseudocode, I think that the main difference between pseudocode and real code is that for pseudocode, the syntax is not as strict. And I would expect uh, our model to work on pseudocode as well, because basically it will share a lot of syntax. Uh, the for loops are very similar. You also have whiles, loops. Uh, you will generally uh, define the operations with the mathematical operators, just like in Python, C++, and Java. I think the main issue would be to find uh, a large data set of, of, of pseudocode that's not as easy to find as for programming languages. And it would be much more difficult to, to test. Um, <laughs> but I, I think it would be doable. Like we, we also have to wonder whether uh, it would be really useful because, so I'm not sure it's much easier to, to, to write pseudocode than to write uh, the same program in a language of your choice. So I'm not sure there will be that many users for uh, something like that, but they definitely it will be impressive and quite interesting. For UML diagrams, I have to say I'm not that familiar with UML diagrams, but I think it will be much more difficult to get crossing wall embedding between the UML diagrams and some code in C++ or Java. Like, I, I would expect that even if there is some overlap on the class names and function names, you will have less anchor points and you, yeah, I expect it will be much harder to find enough anchor points to get a truly multilingual embedding. If you had a very big data set of parallel data between UML diagrams and classes that implement these UML diagrams, you could do something, you will have some other problems to take care of because if it's a UML diagram for many classes and a pretty big project, you will run into some memory issues, but yeah. uh, I guess there will be some ways to, to go around that, like maybe to generate the classes only one by one, to have a, a, a way to distribute your, your, your data on uh, many machines at the same time. Uh, but I guess in, in that case, it, it will be doable. I mean, what, what I find so interesting about these neural approaches where you actually learn on a data set compared to these rule-based things is that if I apply the rule-based thing, it will surely be correct, but it will, I will probably not understand it, right? It, it's like, you know, if I write my TypeScript and I transpile it to JavaScript, it looks like garbage. It looks, and if, if I minify it even more, what I love about these methods is that they, they take the human element into account. And it really, it really shows you that programming, we think of it as a computer language, but it, programming is a human language because I can write the same function in one way where everyone on the world that can code understands it. And in another way where I play, I play Vim golf or I play Perl golf and you know, I, no one understands what I'm doing. Is, is this on your mind? Like does this, so I had this thought of, can, can we write, for example, a decompiler uh, that goes, like, let's say we would have some anchors for assembler or something. This would be like the perfect decompiler, no? Because it would not only generate the C++ code that generates that assembly, but it would generate it in a way that, the, like a human would. Yeah, and I think for a decompilation, as you can like take your code, compile it to have the assembly code, actually you, you can train it in a supervised way. Yeah. So you, you, you don't even uh, need anchor points because yeah, in true. a supervised Yeah, so yeah, I think it could be uh, something else that you can do and you don't even have to, to use the unsupervised methods, but just like the traditional uh, supervised methods. Yeah. So yeah, I think it could That's work. That's an even smarter idea. <laughs> <laughs> If you folks could go back and do it in a completely different way, I mean, for example, one thing you might do is trying to predict the abstract syntax tree 
or, or having more of a structured approach rather than letting the machine learning algorithm do everything. I, I really like what Yannick said before because there is a bit of an art to it. it, it it's very similar to the mathematics paper that Aguilum wrote, which was, he, I think he described in the paper that integration is the black art of the mathematics world. And, and sometimes having fixed rules isn't very good there is a bit of a pattern recognition aspect to it and i suppose that that's actually a really good thing about the the work that you folks have done here our model is completely unconstrained so the good thing about it is that you can generate anything and can sometimes generate some code that is that looks more like what humans would do like for instance if you uh, generate a for loop so um if your for loop if the body of your for loop takes only one line you can choose you can choose to uh, omit the um, curly bracket, and that's something that humans often do, and our method can do that as well, while otherwise we wouldn't be able to do that. Um, also, more importantly, if you um, if your model generates an AST, uh, you will need a method to train it that will be um, a lot slower, like three LSTMs are a lot slower to train because you before you generated the if token, you don't know what you, what kind of thing you will need to generate afterwards. And so we think that methods that generate ISTs are very good for supervised models that work with little data, because in, in that case, it's not really a problem if it's slow to train. And uh, maybe the extra, well, the extra constraints that you put on the output of the model will really give a big boost in terms of in terms of performance but for us because we train on a lot of data and actually our model is pretty good at learning the syntax we are not really convinced that uh, we would really get a big boost in terms of performance by generating an AST however saying that we think that we could do some things at evaluation time to um, constrain our model to generate something that compiles and uh, the data that we have shows that it's something that could really help, especially for the uh, Java uh, to uh, C++ pair. Like in both directions, most of the errors appear at compilation time. So there are definitely some things we could do there. Learning a sorting algorithm, for example, you need to have a dense sampling of the input space. You probably need to have every permutation as, as, as an example to train on. And clearly, you could just write a few lines of code which would generalize much better. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I guess in your in your system, as it appears to me, it's it's pretty cool because you combine the two, right? You combine the human intelligence that writes the code in one language and the machine intelligence to pattern pattern it over to the other languages. I think it's a good example of how these two work in synergy rather than in in opposition to each other. And we don't have to do to let deep learning do. Every, I think Jan Lecan just tweeted out yesterday or something like pretty amazing. And it was like a uh, deep learning system lands Boeing 767. I'm like, no, 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 never. Jan Lecun pointed out we don't understand how the wings work on an aircraft. I was reading an article the other day by uh, that Cassie lady from Google. That she, she posed a philosophical question. Would you rather fly on a plane where you understood how it all worked, but it had never been tested? Or would you rather fly on a plane that had been tested thoroughly? I think in that case, uh, whether you can understand the system, the machine learning system only matters if, the, if you think it's a good pro proxy for how well it will generalize to other test sets. Uh, I would, like if the plane was tested in real situations, uh, I would trust the machine learning system more, even though I don't understand how it works. I would trust the machine learning system uh, that is understandable more when I don't really trust the test set, when I think that the test set doesn't really correspond to what I actually want to use the system on in production. But otherwise, if uh, my test set is exactly, uh, corresponds exactly to the use case I want, uh, then I don't think I need to understand what the system does, unless there are some legal reasons for that. But you could argue that even if it generalized to the test set, that was still local generalization. And clearly in, the, in these high dimensional, semantically complex data sets that we're working with, <laughs> There will be many things that we might see in production that were not in the test set. Yeah, yeah, it's true. But if, you, if your test set is some part of your production data, and if you're confident in, enough that the world is not changing too fast, 
and that this part of your production data that you got at that time is still relevant today, something that you can trust pretty much. The other thing is, Cholet says, in these perception type tasks, and I, I would include language in that, the work that William did on mathematics, that there is a subjective element to it. it we're not in the rules-based world here. But we could take it a step further. What do you folks think we could do to revolutionize software development? What if I no longer have to know multiple languages? What if I could just use any language I wanted to on a particular coding file and the IDE or even Git would actually learn an intermediate representation? C could we revolutionize software with something like this? Well, let me expand on that question a bit. Are you trying to revolutionize software engineering or is this just... Is this just basically, is this just you being researchers or is there actually something that you're pushing for here? So it's, I think when we did the project, it was not just for research, but really we wanted to, to make it work and make it used. But we don't think that with the performance that we have now, this is something that can like really revolution. I think we still need to, we don't want to replace software engineers. We want to maybe help them, but not replace because uh, with the system that we have now, we, we, it can help to translate a function, but you still uh, need to have a software engineer that uh, check that the function is correct. And to uh, translate all projects, you still need some work. So we we want uh, this tool to be to be used, but we don't we don't think it can revolution all the world the, of the computer science world and and replace all the software engineers because we read something like that, but no, <laughs> we don't think so. Maybe a first step to revolutionizing software, and we hope that us and some other people will build upon that, and that that at some point this revolution will will happen. Uh, but yeah, we we're not there yet. There, there's still some work to do. <laughs> So a, a related question maybe what what is because I've I've been wondering about this generally about the research labs and these big companies Facebook as a company it's like it's not they don't have like an IDE that they're you know developing they don't they're not you know do they I don't think they own GitHub they might by now but so so is there like a a product push from the Facebook side or is it or more generally, how much how much do you in the research lab have to go towards a product of the company, or how much are you basically just do whatever you want? I think there is a lot of freedom basically in what researchers and engineers can work on. Basically, people are free to work on whatever they, they think is interesting. It's kind of a fundamental research lab, and so people work on some things that are very practical, like machine translation for resource languages, for instance, something that is very useful to to Facebook. But some people work on some very theoretical aspects of things, or even um, on some like reinforcement learning for gaming, like StarCraft, for instance. So it doesn't have to be something which is necessarily useful for the the Facebook website. There is the, the research lab is not designed to actually develop things that are useful for the Facebook website. But when it is useful, then it's it's definitely good. I mean, people usually like to see their things put into production and see that. The research actually actually useful, but it's encouraged basically. Yeah, and then once uh, some research is used to be useful for production, it's not the team uh, of fair that is going to put it in production. Then there is some discussion and collaboration between some production team and the research team. So basically, we do the research, and then if it's useful, other production team are are going to to use it and and work with us to to put it in production. That's very cool. So it's not it's not really you don't really have to orient yourself towards a product no how much do you have to orient yourself towards what the senior research and maybe guillaume listen away uh, for this one how do how much do you have to orient yourself to what the seniors want or how much are these ideas coming bottom up because i'm, I'm very I, I know academia right and here you know it things work maybe a little bit different how much is their top like how often does jan lecun show up and say here is a research direction, right? This is what we're going to do as a team. Or how often do you come and say, look, here is something really cool that I would like to investigate? I feel like it really depends on who your advisor is and who your senior leader is. But generally, people are very, very free to do what they, what they want to do. And I think that everyone can come up with an idea and come to see his or her advisor saying, oh, I would really want to work on this thing. And expect the other person to, to at least listen to, to it. Like, 
me personally, I feel like I'm very free to do what I feel is interesting. But like for like in academia, it's not always the case for everyone. But in general, people are pretty free to choose their subjects. Yeah, during my PhD at Facebook, it was the same for me. It was basically I don't remember a single instance where somebody wanted to work on something, but either his manager or supervisor was telling him that maybe he should focus on something else instead. I mean, people, of course, I mean, people are advised, but basically in the end, it's the decision basically is to them. I mean, it's given to them. Yeah, and for me, because we all have different roles uh, in fair, so uh, I am a research engineer, and as a research engineer, you, you can choose uh, the, the, the project you want to work on and the scientists you want to work with, and then your manager basically always say yes. So yeah, as a research engineer, you can you can you can choose any project you want. And uh, when I joined Facebook, I was very junior, so I didn't uh, lead any project uh, scientifically. I mean, I, I was more like following. But the more you grow in Facebook uh, AI, the more you can you can choose. And even there are some engineers that uh, come up with some idea without any scientist, and they can lead their project. So I think it's it's pretty free. Amazing. What do you folks think about the state of deep learning at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> what a question. <laughs> no, I mean, what, what, what excites you? Where do you think it's going to go in the next five years? Yeah, I think so, that's something which is uh, currently missing is all the little bit related to everything we've, we've been discussing so far, which is related to the, I mean, the ability of these models to actually do reasoning, for instance, uh, reasoning, but also uh, interpretability. For instance, if you, if you do some question answering, you ask a question to your model, it gives you some answer. So can you explain you why? Can it explain you why it gives this output and not something else? And can you actually, even when you perform some uh, integration or if you output a function, can you guarantee that this is correct? And is there basically some way to have a model which is not rule-based, but you know that can that can manipulate symbolic elements, for instance, not be not only doing some fuzzy reasoning and basically guess the answer, and then you have to manually check that the answer is correct. Can you have some deep learning model that can actually uh, guarantee that whatever they're telling you is is correct, basically? And I think this will not go without interpretability. I think it's all these things are a bit. Uh, um, related and also yeah like it's basically the way the ability of these models to manipulate some discrete elements some symbolic elements like the, the combination of like uh, discontinuous and continuous representations uh, inside this model i think is something which is currently missing and that people actually are currently trying to do do you think interpretability even exists because it can tell you the what but not the how and for example cholet advocates for program synthesis and if you generate a skill program, that's computer code again, and, and you can verbalize what it's doing. But could you, could you ever understand what a deep learning model is doing? I think it will depend on its architecture. But if it's, uh, if it's manipulating some discrete element, if it's manipulating some symbols within its hidden layer or something like this, I think that it will be, it will be much easier to understand what is going on. You will not have basically like uh, 24 layers of like uh, flood, I mean, continuous vectors, and then the output, you will have basically some you'll be able to see like the connection between the elements. Uh, of course, it will still at the end be a bit fuzzy, but you, I think it, you'll get more insights about whether it is correct or not. It's not indispensable, that, but I think it will definitely help. Also, it probably will improve the ability of the model to generalize. So, so yeah, something like this, I think. Basically, uh, putting some constraints on the architecture so that your model is actually manipulating something that you can actually uh, like uh, formalize and that you actually understand. It's very difficult. It's something that a lot of people have tried to do, but it's it's definitely, I think, one of the things that we are missing right now if we want to make progress. In. We had the expert systems in the 1980s, and we would construct these large knowledge graphs, and they had some advantages, but the disadvantage was we had to create them manually, and they were very brittle. They didn't scale very well. You can ask GPT any question, and it will just give you the answer uh, straight away. So that's really, really good in a way. We We want that, but I guess we also want to have what we don't have, which is understanding the behavior and we don't want the memorization. We, we want some kind of abstraction and reasoning to allow us to have more generalization. We, we seem to be stuck in a bit of a rut at the moment in, in the deep learning world. What do you think of the scaling debate? Like, what do you make of all of this notion that the more we scale our models, the better they go, especially in language models, right? Uh, we just see like, Models and models and models, they just pack on the layers and the transformer heads and the inner dimensions and the perplexity just goes 
down and down and down. You having having worked a bit with a different sort of language, let's say da data. How can how can one make sense of this? Like, how is this not overfitting? How is this? How does this work? Yeah. So I think what is interesting is to indeed look at uh, the performance that you can get by just scaling up these models. For instance, what uh, OpenAI is doing with uh, GPT-3, I think it's it's very interesting. Uh, I mean, basically, we still don't really know like what is the ultimate performance that we will get by just like scaling things uh, even more. But but yeah, I think in the end we were. I mean, for instance, they basically had some some very good results on pretty much all the tasks like translation, impression, and so on, everything. But there were some tasks where clearly the model was struggling. For instance, doing some addition of large digits or like multiplication, which I think kind of shows the, kind of the limitation for what we will do by just scaling current models without having some significant changes of architecture or something like this. So I think it's very interesting to see how far we can go by just scaling things. But uh, in the end, I mean, it's pretty clear that we're going to need something else, but it's, it's not clear what we, I mean, we still don't know what it is exactly. We have, we have made a thread on Reddit to collect a bunch of questions and there are a few, so we can just maybe quickly address them. Thunderjax asks, are you planning to open source the code? Have you open sourced the code? Uh, yeah, we are planning to open source the code. We are working on, on this now. <laughs> so we are going to open source the code to train the model, to process, process GitHub the same way we did. We are also are going to open source a parallel test set and all the, um, the unit tests that we built. So uh, in order that uh, people can just test their model the same way we did and all the code to evaluate uh, a model. And yes, finally, we are going to also open source the weights of our model. So in order that people that can't train the model can can use the weights. So we are going to open source uh, all of this. Awesome. We've kind of touched on this, but uh, Joel Tunit asks, what happens when a transcodee encounters a language feature in one language that is not available in another language? For instance, interfaces or asynchronous code would seem to be challenging to translate into Python. So it's sort of what we've discussed with the non-overlapping tokens, but have you seen what happens when you have an entire, let's say, construct or feature of a language that, that isn't available? Does the model work around it or just, does it just fail? Yeah, so typically if it's, for instance, if the, lo if the function is in Python and it's calling um, something like is instance that doesn't really exist in C++ or Java, a library like uh, Pandas that doesn't really have an equivalent library in C++, um, the model is going to, to fail to output the correct output because the, I mean, the ideal output will be to just recreate the whole Pandas libraries and to uh, <laughs> output that, but it's, it's not able to do it. What it does is that sometimes it it just outputs something that is incorrect. And sometimes it will output something that just assumes that you already created a class in Java that does whatever Pandas is doing in this function that you want to translate. And it calls some functions there that don't really... <laughs> Someone else's problem. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. OpenAI <laughs> released an auto-regressive computer code auto-completer thing, which you spoke about, Yannick. The, the way you folks have approached it is slightly different. But what was really cool about that demo was inside an IDE, you could do code completion. I just wonder what kind of use cases could you do with, with your kind of model? So for, for the encoder, you folks are using some kind of a denoising auto-encoder, a, a BERT-type model. What kind of features could you add to an IDE given that representation? You know, could you do some kind of personalization, for example? If we add uh, just one vector representation for one, uh, one sentence, for instance, uh, one um, line, for instance, instruction, like os.remove or something like that, it would be really interesting if we could um, have just one vector representation and then uh, looking at the nearest neighbor to suggest alternatives to just, uh, to, yeah, to have other way to, to implement things. But in order to do that, we need to, because to, to reduce all the um, output of the transformer to just one vector. But, but if we could do that, uh, I think it could be very interesting, but it needs a bit uh, more work, I think. That, that's fascinating. There is so much untapped potential here. Just imagine 
at the moment you can learn a really good representation of a piece of code but what if you looked at all of the projects on github and, and learned the topology of all of the files in a given project and if you can embed all of these into some vector space and it, we're almost taking a step towards being able to create software automatically or yeah. being able to interpolate between two software programs and what would that mean yeah it seems it seems that it's it sounds like something that will at some point be possible with machine learning but that sounds also very difficult I mean, I think there are many things that we can do with machine learning for code generation and people are only starting to look at what is possible. And uh, I mean, I think like, I mean, for instance, like 20 years ago, the automated machine translation system in English, French, it was very bad and nobody was using that. I mean, the professional translators would basically never look into this, but now it's really good and even professional actually use that. And I think for uh, a similar phenomenon will be observed in, I think, in programming languages at some point, maybe like in five years, I don't know. I think that either like machine translation system will be good enough. Maybe they will be good enough in like Python, C++ that people will actually find it useful. It will never be perfect, but I think it's going to be good enough that actually people actually have a, I mean, find it interesting to use it. Uh, like English, French today, uh, Google Translate is not perfect, but still people find it very, very useful. And I think something similar will be observed uh, for programming languages. So um, the task of OpenAI was natural language to uh, code generation. So you actually write a sentence on the model give you like some some code. I think it's very difficult, and I don't know when uh, something like this will be like fully operational. But just simply translating function, I think, is something much simpler, and it could be useful. Like I think very soon, like maybe a couple of years, something like this. Very cool. I, I guess I'm just excited about the possibilities. You can do so much more than say with an autoregressive language model. There's so much structure to a programming project. Just the, the, the names of the files, the relationships between the files, the dependencies in the files. You could model all of that. And I would say there are so many intersections between different software projects. So it, it almost seems that I could just start to create a software project and you would be able to predict what I was trying to do and automate a lot of that away. So I think that's fascinating. But another question I'd like to ask is, uh, and this is to all of you, what's the most important thing that you've learned in the last year? <laughs> I guess it will be unsupervised machine translation. <laughs> it's something that people kind of already know since a long time ago, but I mean, this is the fact that, I mean, in machine learning for no really, um, I mean, the, one of the things that really works the most is just to basically increase the data size, for instance, in natural language. I mean, in, in language modeling, you just have to have more data. In machine translation, in unsupervised machine translation, you don't have any parallel data. So what do you do? You basically create parallel data with back translation. Like in uh, symbolic mathematics, the, basically what we what we just did in our paper was simply create like millions of equations. And people, I think, try often to come up with complicated architectures on complex systems. But basically, I mean, just like vanilla transformers with very, very large data sets, I think um, we can do a lot of things. I think it's not it's not clear how far we will be able to go with just vanilla transformers if we had extremely large corpora. So I think for now, it's basically the importance of the data uh, in whatever task we consider, like how important it is that it's much, there are so many very complicated things that people do like for manipulating equations with like some tree-based models, but just like a simple model with a lot of data is good enough. So I think it's for all of the projects I've been working on, it's these things that you just need to, to find a way to generate, to have better generators and that's pretty much, um, you can go very far with this. That's, that's amazing. There have been so many applications for the Transformers architecture. I think OpenAI have just applied it to doing autoregressive pixel by pixel predictions for reconstructing images. And uh, you, you applied it to modeling complex mathematical formulas. You turn them into an expression tree and then you transform that into a language expression and put them into a transformers model. That fascinates me. How many other applications do you think that we can apply to this? For now, what we are exploring is, so we are working on code generation again, but we are also looking into uh, theorem proving, automated theorem proving. For instance, uh, see if you can actually take some some conjecture or some theorem that, that is difficult to prove and see whether a model can actually generate a formal proof of this statement. And uh, it's something which currently doesn't work really well. I mean, yeah, like automated theorem proving is a pretty old field, like, like several decades, but it's, for now, I mean, it really it doesn't work really well. I mean, even very like trivial statements, it's very hard to I mean to generate automatic proof for that. And I think that deep learning will also work very well here. 
basically the task is just how do you apply deep learning to this particular problem and uh, yeah it's something we are looking at what's fascinating about it is shortcuts exist in mathematics whereas for something like a sorting algorithm there are no shortcuts it is it it tells us things about maths that perhaps we didn't know yeah it's totally possible that uh, a model actually finds an alternative proof to like a problem. I think it's, I mean, that depends. It depends on what is the problem you are trying to solve, what kind of exercises, for instance, if it's some, if it's some like high school problem, and usually the solution is not very complicated. There is not so many ways to access it. But if it's some very complicated conjectures, usually they are built on top of different theories and there are many ways to, to reach the final solution. I mean, there are conjectures that we, I mean, very simple problems that we actually took centuries to solve, but then we actually found very, very different proofs over the time. And it's possible that actually machine learning help, helps us to do something like this. I mean, it's it's kind of long term, but it's, yeah. Since you're all at, at Facebook, is there anything that maybe you've seen into somewhere else or something? Is there anything that is, is special about Facebook AI research compared to maybe other research labs compared to academia? or something like this, because just to get, you know, for people to have an impression of what it's like uh, to be there specifically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can't say anything about that because this is the first uh, place uh, where I work in research. So I don't know how it is elsewhere. So I can't answer that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think compared to, to, to some other places, you get to meet a lot of people. Uh, everyone is interested in what everyone else is doing. And uh, you get to meet a lot of people very easily, also because we all eat together and uh, for lunch and dinner. And so you get to know about everyone's projects. And I, I feel like compared to some other places where I've worked, uh, where I was only getting to know people in my immediate team very well, I'm meeting a lot more people and I, I'm learning about a lot more different projects than before. Well, I'm personally incredibly jealous. I think you folks are living the dream. You're working on cutting edge deep learning for Facebook research. So um, incredibly jealous. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I can just say one thing. It's not a incorporation with other places, but one thing that I'm impressed at, at Facebook AI is that everyone is like very passionate by what is doing and so like ideas are going everywhere and everyone loves i think uh, what it does and i think it really make a difference because uh, they everyone like uh, have pleasure to as betty said to to discuss everything even at lunch or uh, after work and and this atmosphere or like uh, loving what you're doing i think it's really making a difference and this is really the case here i think amazing well in which case I, I think we should we should round this episode off but folks thank you so much honestly it, it, your work is inspirational we really appreciate you coming on the show and thank you. Uh, i hope that <laughs> after you, you release your next paper you have to promise to come back <laughs> sure <laughs> thank you for well, organizing and receiving thank you, yeah. So much. Yeah, thank you very much Brilliant. thanks a lot Remember to like, comment and subscribe. Hit that notification bell. We love reading your comments. 